Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our series entitled On Being a Citizen. I'm Frank Martin, and our special guest today is uh, artist and public health worker, Malcolm Cunningham. Uh, we'll, be, we'll have a discussion of his uh, exhibition at South Carolina State University on view now in the um, Fine Arts Gallery uh, in the Fine Arts Building. The, uh, in the uh, exhibition is entitled uh, drafted in the service of a greater destructive force. And we'll be talking to Malcolm about this title and about the extraordinary uh, juxtapositions of images that he uh, has created in this exhibition. So I'd like to first give a brief overview of um, our museum at South Carolina State University, and to say that this event is the inaugural event in our Twigs Rose Festival of the Arts in Orangeburg County, and a celebration of our local HBCUs and of higher educational institutions in Orangeburg. So I'm going to stop my video for just a second before I come to introduce Malcolm. So the IP Stanback Museum is located on the campus of South Carolina State University. And the uh, museum houses a planetarium and therefore it is both a center for uh, the study of the arts, which would be our internal uh, realities and the study of science, you know, the external realities of the physical universe. And this combination of these two different approaches in one facility is actually unique among HBCUs. We're the only museum and planetarium in the HBCU system across the country. And in our collection, we are often more able to show works of many different varieties in the large gallery space in our main gallery. This was an exhibition installed entitled Epiphanies, which was primarily about how works of art can help us have unusual insights into experience. And as part of our collection, we have an extensive uh, group of African artifacts from many different cultures, the Yoruba, the Vai, the Timne, the Mende, many of the ancestral groups that would have been represented by the gene pool that was captured and enslaved and brought to the coasts of uh, South Carolina. So it's unique also in South Carolina to have this a resource for our students at an HBCU where they could actually see cultural artifacts related to many of the ancestral peoples from whom they may in fact be descended. We also have an extensive collection of photographs in our, the museum, including the original panels from Harlem on My Mind, which was a major exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1968. And this uh, installation is showing you several works here by James Van Der Zee, one of the foremost uh, documentarians of works in Harlem, among other individuals. And here is a beautiful portrait of Langston Hughes when he was still a student at Lincoln University, again in HBCU. We like to uh, celebrate the importance of HBCUs and their contributions to the uh, creative uh, pool in uh, not only our state, but all across America. So first we'll begin with our disclaimer. So the ideas that will be expressed in the program are not necessarily the opinions of administrators or officials at South Carolina State University or any of the associated institutions, but are the carefully considered opinions and ideas of our individual expert guests who are distinguished in their respective fields of endeavor. And our panelists today is speaking here as a private citizen and not necessarily as an institutional representative. So our special guest artist is Malcolm Cunningham, and I'll go back to showing my video. Malcolm Cunningham is a native of Toledo, Ohio, and he works as a visual artist and photographer, but his academic credentials are actually in community-based public health. Um, he has a BS in psychology, and he was a member of the Peace Corps and has recently received a fellowship to Johns Hopkins University. Um, so Malcolm, would you like to say a few words? Uh, just, I'm excited to be here and, and thank you for having me. I'm, I'm excited to talk about this work and, and perhaps uh, have a bit of a dialogue with everyone. So thank you for having me. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to 
talking about the works with you because I said to you, uh, the curator of the exhibition is Ian Welch, who is our professor of printmaking at South Carolina State. And Ian is in the conversation as well. Um, and I said to Ian that the images were incredibly intriguing. And this is one of the first images. Would you just tell us the title of this piece? Uh, it's an estimate of the first expense. Uh, so if you'd like for me to talk about it a bit more, we can, we can certainly dive into it. Okay. Well, for this work, I immediately was struck by the graphic that superimposed mm -hmm. on the uh, print. And that graphic looks like one of the early images of a hunter-gatherer culture from Africa. Is that what inspired that relationship that you're showing there? It is in some ways, uh, although I, I have I have this 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 wonderful resource uh, that is a collection of different types of, of designs from indigenous African peoples over the last uh, few centuries. And one of the images is uh, of this. And this is actually kind of a, a spirit or, or a nymph. Um, so uh, with this image, it's actually a collection of four images from uh, this this series. Um, that is called a proposal to drain the swamp and a description of the dismal swamp, which was written in the 1700s, I believe, and is basically a proposal to hire slaves or not, excuse me, to bring in slaves to to drain a swamp and to produce hemp uh, throughout the dismal swamp and the land between North Carolina and Virginia. So uh, this is actually probably a pretty good example of my approach to the work. A lot of it is about developing counter narratives, developing essentially hexes that, uh, you know, attack these banal documents that are actually quite evil nature. So uh, attempting to, to, in some ways, put a, a, a physical hex or a visual hex on these, on these images, on these documents as a counter to what is being, what is being uh, kept inside. This idea of the document being evil is, I'm assuming, based in the idea that this list the purchase, the prices for people, and it calculates how many people will have to be bought, how um, many years in advance to continue this project. And it also puts into the calculus the idea of the reproduction yep. um, of the, the families of these people being exploited for their labor and their, um, their lives, essentially being stolen in this project to enrich the enslavers. Is that sustainability born of black bodies right, right. Uh, so uh, and one of the things that's that's quite disheartening i guess i would say about it is that uh, george washington you know one of our founding fathers uh, was a critical stakeholder in the development uh, of the actual initiative right so it was written in the late 1720s and uh, was picked up again in around 1760 uh, and pursued for quite some time uh, before failing repeatedly. So uh, yeah, it's, it's absolutely uh, attempting to, to really tease out or, or draw out how horrific these ideas are and getting us to sit with them and to, to truly understand how embedded our history, America's history is uh, with the subjugation of black bodies and also with sustainability and profit uh, born of black bodies, but also um, uh, the the I guess, addressing of disinvested spaces uh, once basically white people pay attention to it. Honestly. Well, the other thing that struck me immediately is that you have this indigenous drawing, which is literally uh, the early evidence of human beings recording their experiences in the world by making rock drawings. It's the thing that really makes us human. And it's what's going to lead to the creation of an alphabet and to writing and the mm -hmm. symbolic communication. And so you have this first humans um, kind of image. And of course, we all agree more or less now in science um, that human beings originated, modern human beings originated on the continent of Africa. So all existing human beings are descendants from these original indigenous peoples of the African continent who uh, developed the very large brains, they developed the symbolic communications and developed the institutions so it's connecting something from the distant prehistoric past with something from our history that, as you say, is heinous 
um, and malevolent. Uh, tell us a little bit more about why a hex and, and explain to the, in case we have students here who should be here, uh, what a hex is, what how magic is involved in what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I would also I would also point out another potential connection or, or counter uh, in that the codification of these sorts of things were almost always written word, uh, but the way that uh, uh, Africans were navigating the world uh, leading up to that point was through the spread of, of oral histories, of storytelling, of, of visual uh, kind of reproduction, whether it was through those designs that we'll see later on or through uh, you know, kind of these sorts of um, drawings. Uh, so I, I think that's kind of an interesting piece. Uh, and I'm kind of, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on your question because I wanted to make oh, sure no. that I got that point <laughs> out. No, I was just going to say, uh, because you, what, a part of your statement is that you intend to create hexes as, and counter yes. narratives. Yes. Um, a hex is a, a, a magical formulation and often we think of, and I think of the Nkizi and Kondi figures of the Bakongo uh, peoples, there are, um, there's an interest in the control of supernatural forces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so hexing is a very uh, African approach Absolutely. to correcting. Absolutely. So I, I was hoping you would talk a little bit about how and why these images are conceived of as uh, magical corrections or magical reformulations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that one of the counters that's worth pursuing uh, when, when redefining ourselves, when, when finding that agency, when finding that sense of uh, resistance to these sorts of things is leaning into the, the spirituality that we've carried with us for so long. Um, and, and I believe honoring that through you know, the reproduction of hexes or even bringing that idea to the fore when dealing with, uh, again, these, these quite now, but still quite heinous uh, uh, documents. Uh, so really, uh, all of this work is about counter narratives. All of this work is about, uh, you know, attempting to, to remix or, or recreate uh, what religious iconography looks like, you know, uh, what, what documentation looks like, uh, uh, what the stories are, um, and, and how we can kind of pull in these, these spiritual practices, these indigenous practices, these things that have carried us to this point. Uh, so that's really what my purpose is with, with these, uh, these images. This is marvelously related to the study of psychology. And of course, the, the drawings that, these, uh, that that image is uh, itself inspired by were often drawings made as ceremonial and magical uh, tribal works. They're, they're, they're there not only to communicate messages, but also to hold spirits and to transfer this information about uh, about magic. Um, this is a sand rock painting from Cedarberg in uh, Western Cape, South Africa. Um, so these are some of the oldest mm. examples of humans uh, making art in the world. Now this is a cut off image. Um, and this is part of the description of the Dismal Swamp and a proposal to drain the swamp. And this is by uh, Bird, by William Bird. I think I have the more complete image here. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure that looked to me like a sort of helmet mask. What is that object that you have superimposed on the writing? Yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a mask. It's a mask. And the images, the, the images, the designs that I'm using are pretty much all from the Congo Kinshasa region, with the exception of that Bantu image that you showed before. So it's all Congo Kinshasa because honestly, I discovered a few years back. Uh, that I'm from that region or my family is from that region. And also just knowing that so many of us uh, came from that area and, and traveled all the way over here. So. so these images have a connection to ancestry in two ways. It's the indigenous traditional African forms. The helmet mask is usually used in some sort of a ceremony. Um, what particular, do you know what this particular mask is used for? I don't, I don't. Yeah. Um, but I could have shown, I thought about showing one of the Mende masks because mm -hmm. as it happens, I have, you know, everyone's doing their DNA now and I have a lot of Mende ancestry because it's, it's a predominant group in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And I recognized immediately the helmet mask form, but I, I wondered um, how this mask was used. And usually I would tell the audience that these masks were used in ceremonies to cover because when, when someone is being possessed by the spirit, their ordinary human flesh was not to be shown. 
Mm. And usually it's a costume that's also attached beneath the mask to cover from head to toe that person to protect them from the power they were invoking by calling upon these ancestral spirits. Mm. Um, in this work, uh, and we may come back to the helmet later, I thought this looked like one of the ankle bracelets that was familiar from the Kron people or from the Down. Or you said, but most of the images you took were from the Congo region. Yes. And to be honest with you, I it's it's quite clear that you are far more well versed uh, in these in these uh, you know, kind of indigenous images than I am. And uh, I'm hoping to to continue to learn more and more into it. But this is. Uh, from the Congo Kinshasa region. And this is some of the, the early work that I was starting to do around uh, kind of remixing and, and playing with these images. So honestly, I would love to hear uh, more about, about uh, what, what this image uh, could potentially signify. Well, the thing that struck me about it was you have the notification from, I think this is William Byrd's, uh, uh, this was the cost in lives of people. And it, and it says, and if, they happen to die, if the people they're enslaving and uh, abusing happen to die, that they would be fully supplied by their children. They're going to be replaced. They're, 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 they're um, expendable. Yep. It's what's outrageous about this conceptualization. But the other, the double entendre part of this is that these uh, brass anklets were also used as a kind of monetary unit. Hmm. And they were in indigenous communities also um, use with people who were enslaved. I'm going to pull up an example. This is uh, an example of one made of, they were usually they were made of copper or brass or, or uh, bronze. And they were worn around the ankles and they were weights for individuals who had been enslaved, often usually women. And um, it, as you can see, it's beautifully decorated. This one is uh, Omani, I think it's uh, an Arab uh, bracelet that was used. But we have some examples from the Quran and Dan peoples in our collection. So when I saw those, again, that's why this, this exhibition intrigued me. I was just fascinated right away to understand uh, what you were trying to communicate to your spectator. So with that said, this, this, this superimposition of traditional African cultural artifacts on documents about the uh, development of slavery and exploitation in the West and in, in, in America particularly, and particularly in regard to the Dismal Swamp, which is this, what is it, like a 3,000 acre, uh, what, tell us a little bit about the, the Dismal Swamp. Please. Between North Carolina and Virginia, uh, just a, a sizable swamp uh, that was also home to a, a couple of different initiatives taken up by slaves, but also by uh, you know, by Indians, uh, by by uh, white folks as well. So uh, there were two types of, of maroons or marinage that took place in the Dismal Swamp, right? So there was uh, Petit and there was Grand. So uh, Petit was typically uh, escaping from the plantation or from your owner for brief periods of time uh, to take care of your business, to handle whatever those things are. And then there was the Grand type, which was uh, leaving uh, and only coming back to resist or to capture more people to bring them back into the swamp with you. So I really, I started, I started exploring uh, the idea of marinage and the idea of resistance and disinvested spaces and spaces that uh, are, are otherwise not considered worthwhile until the right proposal comes along, right? So I really liked the idea of black folks escaping and creating their own realities, creating their own worlds within a disinvested space. Uh, and, oh, go for it. Well, I was just gonna say, I, I don't know if our, 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 especially if our students are in this conversation, if they realize that there were thousands of Africans who had liberated themselves yeah. living in the dismal swamp. Yeah. And some of them evidently had never seen a Caucasian person, they, they, they were able to stay in that area and have a certain uh, margin of safety. And um, I don't think that that is widely disseminated in our history of courses or that, that there were free black people hiding in this huge swamp between Virginia and North Carolina who had created autonomous lives. Yep. And um, essentially, sometimes they were mixing with, as you said, indigenous uh, native communities. And sometimes there were also Europeans 
who mix into those populations. Mm -hmm. um, just to go back to sharing and go, let's see if I can find. So this dismal swamp um, emerges several times in various works. Uh, now this was a different piece and I'll, I'll come back to the dismal swamp because there's a, um, a quite a comparatively famous painting that emerges that we'll see in a moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this was the piece where you have redacted it, but it's about insurance. And it's about um, profiteering again from the lives of the enslaved by insuring them. And when the people were, if, if the person was to be deceased, the enslaver would actually receive a, yes, receive yeah. a payment. Yep. Could you talk a little bit about this piece? I'll see if I can have some, I have a few close-ups, I think, that you can mm -hmm. see the, the Southern Mutual Life Insurance Company. Yep. So uh, to step back a bit, uh, I began developing counter-narrative poems maybe about two or three years ago. Uh, I was really inspired by an artist named uh, uh, Alexandra Bell. She, she develops, uh, she actually takes large scale images of like the New York Times as an example and edits them uh, in order to reflect the true reality from her perspective of, of what's going on. So she has, uh, you know, uh, one with uh, Mike Brown in the front cover and she kind of recreates that entire idea and wheat paste it. So to be honest with you, I, I was exploring the idea of what that would look like in the form of, of uh, kind of oral storytelling or like kind of the griot sort of idea um, and also with archival documents. So it was really pulling a concept from Alexandra Bell, uh, bringing in this interest in archival work and also this interest in creating counter narratives. So the image that you're showing uh, is actually from the Charleston Confederate, um, which was a newspaper that ran from 1861, 1861 through 1865. Um, and it's another example of one of those documents that's uh, banal on its, on its surface, uh, but in practice actually has some, some fairly horrific aspects to it. Uh, so, you know, if you, if you were able to, to pull those, those uh, blackouts off, you would see, you know, advertisement for butter, right? Uh, advertisement for, uh, you know, loose leaf tobacco or whatever those things are. And it's right next to these mutual life insurance things, which uh, were quite literally, uh, you know, the birth of, of some pretty significant modern insurance company. Uh, so uh, I wanted to just uh, tease that idea out and again, attempt to create some sort of counter around this, this thing that uh, was banal on its surface, but was actually heinous in practice. Uh, so the, the counter narrative poem uh, within that is, uh, I just pulled it up. Furnish their quotas, volunteer by the owner, uh, detain slaves, furnish their legal labor, uh, value the Negroes uh, before the formation, the reformation, excuse me, of the public mind. So uh, just exploring these ideas, uh, forcing people to sit with uh, the banality of, of, of evil and of profit uh, that, that comes with these sorts of documents and also just with the very structure of slavery. So, well, of course, the thing that comes to mind is the famous phrase by Hannah Arendt, the philosopher who observed the trial of, uh, I think it was Eichmann in Israel, mm -hmm. and she coined that phrase, the banality of evil, how evil can have this awful uh, practical side. It's the, the same, this is an equivalent of the kind of um, viciousness that was the structure for how Jewish people were exterminated in Europe, but except this was even more millions of people in America who were worked to death and who created profits because the enslavers were insuring their lives and then working them until you know, they, they often succumbed. And in some instances, I think, I know there's a very famous uh, case of the Zong vessel, um, which is an English vessel, the slaving ship, where the captain had thrown the people, they captured these people, they, they kidnapped them from Africa, they brought them out into the middle of the ocean. And because I think they got, some of them were ill, they would make more money from the insurance. They just threw the people yeah. overboard. They, they murdered the people and they were not tried for murder, but they were tried for fraud. Yep. 
you know, yeah. So it, and I do sometimes uh, feel it's necessary to let our students know about these kinds of stories because unless you understand the heinous nature of what slavery was, of what, it's chattel slavery, especially, it's the, the mythology that has been around for a long time of you know, the, the benevolent state slaveholder, there's, there's just no such thing really. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 an, it's an impossible thing. Mm -hmm. Now, you probably recognize this. <laughs> <laughs> this is Piero della Francesca's Polyptic of the Misericordia um, in the Pinacoteca Common Valley in San Sepolcro in central Italy in Tuscany. And I'm showing it because that central panel of the um, Madonna of Misericordia is something that we're gonna see that you completely transform. And uh, this is just a close up of it. And by the way, this figure happens to be a portrait of the artist Piero della Francesca. Oh, wow. uh, that I happen to do Italian, but it's not sorry, this is something <laughs> that, that, that just hung out in my imagination there. But you transform that cloak hmm. uh, and you've inserted a Thomas Moran painting in it. So would you just talk a little bit about what you've done here? Because when I, this is the thing that really struck me. I thought this was just incredibly brilliant. So just talk a little bit about this, please. So I, I call this one uh, the Black Madonna, uh, which I'm sure is, is probably pretty straightforward if you can, if you can kind of see that. Uh, so, you know, this is, this is where I started to explore the idea of recreating or, or, or pulling out uh, Western religious iconography and, and using it to create something of our own uh, and, and really just honoring those indigenous designs, those masks, those talismans, those expressions of wealth, whatever those things are um, in order to, again, so with this, with this particular collection, I had hexes and I had consecrations and I considered this one a consecration. Uh, so, you know, a prayer for the slaves that were escaping through the Dismal Swamp, which is the Thomas Moran painting. Uh, another image from the Dismal Swamp that's just haunting. Uh, I'm, I'm blanking on, on who created the other one on the other side, unfortunately. Well, the print but, with the vulture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't, didn't look that one up, but um, But yeah. the, the, idea, the idea was to treat this one as a consecration, as a way to bless or to provide, uh, you know, that sense of, of, of strength uh, within, the type of iconography that historically had been used to subjugate black people. So Western religion, um, you know, designed and, and deployed with black people in a way that, you know, maintained subjugation. And how do we reject that? How do we uh, pull it in uh, and, and tie in our own indigenous practices, our own in indigenous imagery in order to do that? Well, I particularly was struck by this mask. And you said that you tended to use images that had come from the Congo, because that's yep. your own ancestral. And I looked at this and I assumed that it's a bimba mask. Is that right? I, I do not know. I do not know. Well, this is an example of a bimba mask from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And here's another example. Mm. And ironically, the bimba mask is used specifically to welcome young men back into the community after they've been gone, after they've been away. Yeah. So um, if you, if, if, if when you use the Madonna of Misericordia, the Madonna of, um, of mercy uh, is what this is. And this mm -hmm. welcoming, because in if we look at the Thomas Moran painting, and I, I'll have that in there later, mm -hmm. of course, that's people who are being hunted. And um, the Madonna's protective cloak is to shield everyone from harm. And I thought about that idea of welcoming someone back into a community um, being combined with uh, this sort of idea of mercy that was incredibly poignant. And I, I just wondered about, you know, what caused you to arrive upon this particular juxtaposition of images? Um, it, it certainly felt right. Uh, and it was about, you know, providing that, that protection, providing that counter, but I did not know that the bimba mask was uh, was uh, a reference to welcoming people back in. Uh, so I would love to take credit for that, but I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> One of those happy accidents. There we go. Um, and this shows in more detail the uh, the uh, image from the uh, Thomas Moran painting, and this was the other work, the etching. Mm -hmm. um, I think this was uh, from the uh, author I 
don't remember at this moment exactly who that uh, artist is, but we can look it up. We can find it. You can send that to me later. Um, I think that the next image is actually art. So this is the, the painting. And would you talk a little bit more about why it was fascinating to you to create these images around the idea of marinage, around this idea of Africans freeing themselves? I thought, I thought that it was one of the most clear examples of a living, breathing counter to the, the stories that have been told about our experiences with slavery. Um, I, I think it's always escape uh, or suffer um, or be saved by outsiders. Uh, and it's rarely about freeing oneself. It's rarely about acts of resistance. It's rarely about uh, going back to get your own. Um, and it's also rarely about uh, thriving despite being in a disinvested space. Um, so I thought that all of those things were, were key to, to the message that I'm hoping to, to put forth with these counters. Um, and, you know, that I think, I think the Thomas Moran painting is kind of a perfect entry point into that idea. Uh, it's it's a, a, another one of those images that's, that's haunting, that's beautiful, um, but is also, you know, hopefully uh, a chance to, 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 to escape or to, to step into this world um, that has support despite the, the ruggedness, despite the, the, the difficulty of the surroundings. Uh, and as I was creating these, I was also um, thinking about the Great Migration. I was thinking about uh, Toledo, Ohio, which, oh. is, um, uh, which was also a swamp initially. Uh, and uh, uh, it's called, actually, it's, it's actually called the Great Black Swamp uh, is what it's called, which is interesting. Uh, and was also a place full of you know, mosquitoes, pestilence, things of that nature. So I just thought of the idea of uh, you know, black folks uh, thriving and persisting through marinage of uh, following the great migration up to the north to Toledo, Ohio, right? Uh, landing in another type of swamp and then experiencing life in another disinvested environment in another uh, place that is structured for them not to succeed, but despite that still succeeding. Uh, so, you know, what does a ghetto look like? A ghetto is a food swamp, right? A ghetto has been redlined, a ghetto has been segregated and isolated. Uh, so kind of tying those threads together uh, to talk about not just the subjugation, but also the, the history, the, the through line of resistance that we can apply to ourselves today. Uh, so that's really that's really what I was going for, and this is such a striking image. Uh, just um, it's really stunning colors and just form. Uh, and uh, so there were those things, and then the other piece that I don't think I, I tied into this collection uh, is from a series that I was also doing, um, I think maybe 2014, 2015, uh, with uh, with overgrowth throughout the city of Toledo. So I was going around to different locations in Toledo and taking you know, landscapes uh, of, of uh, uh, places in urban, in urban environments that have been overgrown and that were being taken back essentially by nature. So just kind of tying all those threads together and finding similar visual and like kind of color tonality. Well, the thing I should have done, which I apologize is let me go back. Um, I go back because it, the marinage image is in the next picture as well. But what I didn't do is I didn't zoom in and show the details here. And I should have done that because I don't know if people can see the marauding, the dogs, mm -hmm. the large, I guess they're like Great Dane or hunting dogs that are here. And in the shadows back here are the slave hunters. Yeah. So they're, they're, the people in the swamp, which has this, this sort of beautiful haunting uh, paradise-like quality on the one hand, but it's a place of menace because while they've escaped, there's this, uh, these slave hunters are after them. And when you mentioned um, Ohio, I immediately thought of the fact that Ohio uh, came into the United States uh, Union as a free state. However, because of the fugitive slave laws, if someone escaped to Ohio, they could be captured and all that they had acquired uh, could be taken from them and they would be sold. And I immediately thought of the story uh, that inspired uh, Toni Morrison mm -hmm. 
to write, but love it. Do you want to tell about that story? No, Just, go for it. No, <laughs> no, I was, so it's, um, Margaret Garner was a woman who had escaped with her children to freedom. And she'd had a baby while she was free in Ohio. She'd escaped from, I think she was escaped from Virginia as it happened. And the slave catchers found her. And rather than have her children sold back into slavery, she tried to kill them. She, she murdered the baby and she tried to um, disable or kill the, the two sons and another daughter that she had. And so that movie, Beloved, is about how the mother is haunted by the child she loves so much, she would rather see the child dead than be returned or forced into what she'd had to endure in enslavement. And um, as I think that's one of the books that's being banned right now in so many places because of the story. It's a horror story, but it's, it's about something, it's based on a true story. It's, it's based on something that really happened. So when I see the enslaved or the escaped people, the free, the self-freeing people under the, the cloak of the Madonna, they're seeking refuge. That was especially poignant to me. That was, I, again, I just, the way you had uh, juxtaposed the images, I found it's incredibly moving. And then it, oops, that's, I went in the wrong direction. And then that um, painting reemerges here. Now, I don't know if people can see it. Would you talk about the overlay patterns and then the inset photograph because it's laid over that Thomas Moran painting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's pretty, I, I wouldn't necessarily call this one too heavy handed, but it is quite heavy handed just uh, to, uh, to be honest with you. So this is actually a, a picture from the late 2010s uh, in Louisiana, I believe. Uh, and that is a correctional officer and those are prisoners. Um, so, 13th Amendment, right? It says uh, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude uh, with the exception of punishment for a crime, right? I think that's the, that's the wording. Uh, so again, tying those threads between the past and, and present state uh, and applying those hexes, right? Applying those, those counters to this, this connection, this, this overlaying of, of things that's happened, that uh, have happened and that continue to happen. So it's kind of a layering. It's kind of a, a attempting to separate those things and, and also to uh, to provide a, a blessing in some way. So the, the blue, uh, I'm considering that blue kind of a haint blue, uh, mm. which um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, which you're you're of course familiar with. Um, well, I'm in South Carolina, so <laughs> yeah, we have to be. Have We've to got be. lots of haint blue windowsills down here. We can explain it in a minute. Go, go ahead. I, I should have interrupted your thought. Go oh, ahead. you're fine. You're fine. Uh, so I mean, that's honestly what that, that idea is. So this is again from that series of what, whether it's a consecration or a hex. Uh, and to be honest with you, this one is somewhere in between for me. Uh, it's definitely about separating those and also forcing someone to sit with um, you know, the idea of escaping in one context versus another, uh, you know, the, what do they say? The overseer, I think that was a, oh man. I'm, I'm blanking for some reason. KRS-One, right? KRS-One, okay, yeah, yeah. uh, he, he says, officer, officer, overseer, over, you know, he starts uh, to rhyme those yeah. two ideas together. So uh, I really, I really like the idea of just like explicitly making that connection and then providing that separation and then also providing that paint blue, uh, again, with that, that traditional Congo Kinshasa pattern, um, the paint blue, of course, being to protect uh, from from the evil spirits uh, in this context, of course, being uh, you know different iterations of enslavement. Now, so this is a traditional pattern uh, for an African fabric, usually, right? That would be yes. Yeah. Yep. So um, the the paint blue, and then the black and red. Do, does the black or the red? Or is, is what is that maroon? Maroon from Marinage. Do they have any also? Do they have any symbolic significance? Uh, I mean, this was color. Yeah, it's black people and it's maroons. Yep. Ooh, yeah. yep. mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry. And if you and if you also look closely, there's another uh, image that's kind of sneaking in of a of a uh, police officer chasing after then, a kid yes. with a football, and it's. Uh, uh, if I can bring that up a little yeah. bit better. Nope, 
that obscured it. Sorry. No problem. Let's go back for one. Right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the benevolent police officer of the neighborhood, law enforcement. Uh, yeah, so you're juxtaposing that idea. And I think that we're going to see another one of those. Yep. And in that instance, um, he is uh, an African-American chasing an African-American child. So showing a different context for the chase, mm -hmm. um, something that is uh, psychologically rewarding as, something, as opposed to something that is uh, frightening or horrifying or that is going to result in some sort of uh, degradation or attack. Yeah, that was, again, I, I really was intrigued by these. <laughs> Um, well, that's just a close up of the, mm -hmm. of the photograph. Um, now, and again, the Thomas Moran painting is mm -hmm. underneath. Now, is this from Birmingham, this scene? Uh, no, it isn't. It isn't. It's okay. 1964. I think it's in New York. I think it's in New York. Let me, let me just make sure that I'm giving you the right information. Okay. Because um, I saw the fire hoses. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, that's the scene that the Birmingham uh, the abuse of the crowd of the, uh, the fire hoses was famous in Birmingham. I'm almost certain that that was in New York mm -hmm. um, in the in 1964 or something around there, from what I recall. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the New York riots probably in Bronx or okay, and. So this is a police officer. Mm -hmm. This is a police officer. I'm not sure if this looks like it's also a police officer because I can see his gun. Yep. So they're superimposed over the marinage, the, uh, the escaped uh, people who were enslaved. Talk a little bit about how you're bringing these two contexts together. Uh, I, so this is a part of kind of the next iteration of the, the work that I was doing. I was working with an artist, Lauren Williams, uh, who presented an idea um, called uh, abolish literally everything except the police, which is uh -huh. you know, was was tongue in cheek. Right. Um, uh, we had been we had been kind of dialoguing and connecting about uh, the, the images that were coming out from the U.S. Mexico border with the Haitian uh, migrants uh, that were that were attempting to, to make it into the country um, and the images that came out of uh, you know uh, men on horseback with whips uh, going after Haitians was striking was horrifying uh, gained a lot of traction in the media and the response was let's remove the horses right so the response was uh, they won't be on horseback anymore right they'll they'll uh, they'll uh, interact with them uh, in a more, I guess, humane way, quote unquote. Uh, and so what we were saying was, this is a horrific and broken thing, regardless of whether or not the instrument that you use or the tool that you use uh, exists, right? It's the structure that's horrific, it's not the horse. Um, so we started playing with the idea of removing and, and juxtaposing and creating images where you remove uh, the police officer or the tool that they use um, as the the instrument of enforcement and uh, you know you kind of bring in something else that counters it or that serves as a way to force one to sit with the the nature of the overall structure I guess I would say um, so so that's really what that series is about uh, there's another image that you'll that may be included in this collection that you'll see that um, see if I can has that same idea Go back. Um, so is that where the idea of drafted into the service of a larger destructive force as a title came from? It's a it's somewhat from that. It's also uh, Lauren actually gave me a book uh, by Christina Sharp called uh, called In the Wake. Um, mm. And there's a line uh, in In the Wake um, that that actually talks about, uh, you know, kind of the idea of the master's tools are never going to dismantle the master's house, right? But in the right. context of, in the context of, uh, uh, actually uh, being uh, a black academic, right, and attempting to navigate uh, in this world that is not designed for you, and having to, uh, in order to actually be received within these institutions, you have to produce work 
that aligns with the same values, the same language, the same approach as those that are still in that same structure. So the larger surface, the larger destructive force uh, could be academics, but it could also be whatever those things are, right? However, however a human being has to survive um, almost always is about recreating that system that already exists. Um, and, and in order to truly rupture that, or in order to truly sit with that, we have to pull on our, our indigenous practices, right? Our, our creativity, our different approaches that are completely outside of uh, the, the structure that you're in. Um, so that's really, that's really where the, the uh, title comes from. Um, I think uh, even, you know, you mentioned the book banning uh, and how that's a type of force that exists that uh, uh, needs to be ruptured in some way, right? Or, or has, we have to consider new ways of uh, engaging with this information, spreading it and, and uh, truly sharing, you know, the story um, if these other avenues get shut down, right? So uh, that's really, that's really why the title exists. I don't, I don't know if that. That made sense. I don't know if that was very clear, but no, that it was because what uh, the issue raised is um, the difficulty if you're in a society that's heterogeneous, because you know the amalgam of different kinds of people that make up what is America and the different histories of those different people um, intersecting, but still having those overlaps in the past that were often so very destructive, and now trying to find a way to move forward. Um, in a mutually affirming way is has become the challenge and it's uh, being oh sorry <laughs> it's being played out by the um difficulties that we have in terms of these tensions in society with the culture wars so the thing i was thinking about is since you mentioned uh this idea of a kind of synthesis that's needed for if you're an african descended person and you need to have counter narratives, you need to have countermeasures and counter hexes mm -hmm. in order to uh, survive with integrity in a culture that originally was construed to uh, either subjugate you or destroy you. Mm -hmm. um, how do you move forward in a society that's going to, it, the society will have to remain mixed. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, there have been movements to separate, but yeah. I don't know how realistic those movements are. Right. So, and since you were, psychology major and now you're dealing with public health and all the outcomes that stem from these these problems yep. and this art and i'm going to get to that question on memory i sent to you in a few minutes what do you think uh are the measures that persons of african ancestry in particular but not just persons of african ancestry, indigenous americans uh, americans of um in in this current climate uh if you're a follower of islam if you're a person of um uh, who speaks a, a different language. It doesn't have to be Spanish. It could just be almost anything now. Or if you're Asian American, how do you, uh, how do you create harmony mm -hmm. in a culture that's become so badly divided just as, an, as a health worker, as an artist, and as a psychologist? Not too many questions. <laughs> I, I, I return to community, uh, a sense of community with like-minded people, or perhaps with people that uh, at the very least have a, have a shared sense of, of values when it comes to the willingness to engage with difficult topics. Um, mm -hmm. And I come back to the idea of gathering around a purpose, you know, whether that's food, whether that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, spirituality, whatever those things are, I think creation of those spaces where we can carve out time to be our true and full selves and to explore uh, these different aspects of our identity that have been hidden for so long or that have been subjugated out of us, um, yeah. I think is, is just critical. Uh, you know, like, is it a book club? Maybe, is it, you know, like, is it, whatever those things are, I think it's, it's just critical. And I think that art is a key piece of that. Um, I have a, a very strong, collection of friends that I talk about these things with that I think through ideas with um, you know we uh, 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 you know one of my friends we what did we do we we had a, a a party where we we took portraits and the portraits were based on 
uh, Malik Sidibe's uh, portraits in his studio in the 70s, right? So post-colonial photography where they're, they're, creating, they're creating images of themselves. It's the high life era. Uh, it's about crafting an image of what you want to be, of what you believe uh, success looks like in your own context while considering all of the Western things that have come down upon you, right? So like they're wearing Western style dress, right? Uh, but they're still themselves. They're still defining, they still have a sense of community and they have this visual beauty, this art. So I, I really think it's, it's, it's building that sense of community. It's building that sense of connection uh, and it's play, you know, like that's a, that's a playful, that's a fun thing. Uh, that's, 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 uh, that's so valuable that I think is, is critical. Um, well, that sense of play and I think that sense of, well, when you said food, of course, that is one of the best ways to build community. Really good food will, will heal a lot of things um, and good discourse. Um, so yeah, I think that those perhaps are uh, inroads that society can create to, be, to begin to fashion the language of the conversations we really do need to have, which are difficult. They're, they're difficult conversations and um, we have to, it's, it's a whole new way of being that has to be fashioned. And that's, that's, always, that's always hard. Now for, these, for this series of images and the ones that deal with the uh, yearbooks, I'm probably gonna to have to come out of the PowerPoint because I didn't uh, put them in here because there's so many close-ups. I just decided I would just yeah. go to my file and pull them. <laughs> but would you tell us about, could you tell us something about this photograph of um, these two individuals whom nobody mm -hmm. probably recognizes now? <laughs> Andrew Young, MLK. Uh, MLK was actually incarcerated at the time um, and was being sent to um, to uh, to speak in front of a grand jury about some of the racial uprest that was happening. Uh, racial uprest, which you know, uh, is a certain type of framing, uh, but it was happening in Florida. Uh, I don't remember the city, unfortunately, but it was a uh, it was uh, he was leaving um, uh, from the grand jury testimony to actually go back to his, his prison, and there's actually a police dog in the back seat alongside him. So that's another, that's another one that's uh, um, kind of uh, abolish everything except the police almost sort of thing. So that, that kind of play that, that Lauren uh, kind of brought up and that I, I kind of ran. So the silhouette that looks almost like, let me see if I can find. Uh, I may have a copy of it. Hold on, you've got it. I have to let you share your screen. I think I, I think I do. Let's see here. Oops. To stop share. If you don't have it, I've got it. Can you share it? Oh, uh, you can go for it if you if you have it. Let's see if I can. I'm going to have to come out of my PowerPoint. And I'll have to share my very messy desktop with everybody, which I probably shouldn't <laughs> let people see what happens behind the scenes here. But hold on one second. So let's see, there's this close up. That's part of the silhouette of the dog and I was that was to show what was happening in the background um let me see let's try number two yeah so here are the they're the dog's ears and the whiskers on the side and it looks like because of how you decided to do the photo montage it looks like a burn pattern but it's actually the silhouette of that, of the dog, of the police dog. And then inside the dog, there's this action going on. Let's see if I can. I just, uh, I dropped it in the chat. You did? Okay. Let's see. There's the dog, right. Thank you. Yeah. 
Excellent. Okay. So, what's a dog is riding shotgun for a doctor? No. <laughs> so, what was your idea when you displaced the dog with this image of community policing? Because that's what that was. Yep. Yep. I'm a pretty docile looking dog. I'll say that much for him. You know. Yeah, I think that's I think that's uh, that's fair to say. I, honestly, it was it was playful, um, just kind of juxtaposing the absurdity of uh, Martin Luther King uh, being, you know, essentially locked up in the back of a car, uh, sitting alongside a thing that was used as an instrument of terror throughout his era, um, and replacing it with uh, this this image. Um, of kind of a, a smiling and, and playful uh, cop, you know, kind of creating these other types of uh, narratives or engagements that don't always reflect, uh, again, kind of does that truly reflect uh, the, the horror that can, that can sit beneath police and, and team, uh, Black team interactions? You know? Yeah, so this is an ideal of community policing that is possible Right. But is read. that the reality that we, yeah, exactly. Yep. Yep. Um, and I will point out that in the Thomas Moran picture, there is all, there are two dogs um, who are hunting the uh, self-freeing enslaved people who were, who were, were trying to escape. So yeah, the dog um, in civil rights has a mm. pretty ugly <laughs> uh, history and an ugly uh, role. Now, I think that uh, the next image is one that includes your mother. Hold on one second. And I, so is Elizabeth Monocure, is that, that's your mom, right? Let it's, me just my, uh, it's my grandmother. It's, it's your grandmother, grandmother, sorry. No, it's no problem. Okay. And I'm gonna open, I think the high school here is the high school picture. And this was also in Toledo? Yes, it is, it is. Uh, this is uh, Toledo, Ohio. It's. Libby High School in uh, 1941. It's the 1941 yearbook. And I actually found this image maybe in the last two or three months. Um, mm. So I'm, I'm beginning to kind of transition into making a lot of this archival work uh, more centered around my, my family's uh, story. Uh, and this is kind of a piece of that. It's definitely a work in progress, but of course, another counter narrative poem, um, Elizabeth Monocure, um, uh, her family moved up from Alabama in the 20s, uh, and they lived in a neighborhood that I actually grew up in that was redlined. Uh, so that re the initial redlining map in Toledo was in 1938, and this is you know her in 1941. So um, she lived on a street called Belmont. Belmont still exists, uh, and you know just just exploring what those counter narratives, what those those through lines of, of both subjugation and resistance look like in a deeply personal context. So that's really what this, this series is about. Um, it's also a school that, you know, shifted to become predominantly black over time. Um, but at the time, you know, she was one of not very many. Um, so the, the counter narrative uh, is uh, you ought to hear this young miss sing, uh, this ambitious little girl endures, never de dejected, blessed. So so these are the comments left by her classmates, or that was the, uh, I think I have, so you ought to hear this young, you ought to hear this young miss sing, mm -hmm. and never dejected, blessed. So she was a person with a very cheerful personality. Is that something that was that's typed into the uh, yearbook itself, or is that something that you added? That was that was uh, blacking out everything with the exception of those things. So that was inside of the original yearbook photo. So that's so when they did the yearbooks, someone wrote a commentary. I guess the yearbook editor, or was it friends of your grandmother who would have written that? Do you know? I think that every every student has one or two lines about them. And uh, hers were, you ought to hear this young miss sing. Um, and so everything else that's inside there are actually comments that were about other students, but I, uh, I pulled them out to, to kind of make my own, my own story and my own tale. 
And so the other thing is, um, I think I was in the gallery where, because I this I'm not showing all the panels of um, the other members of the class, so I didn't I didn't do all of those panels. But when people generally looked at the panels, they overlooked the African Americans who were present in the groups, um, mm -hmm. and I I found that interesting because there were well I'm thinking about six or seven. Mm -hmm. But some people saw no one, so so did they? They blended in. They 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 disappeared, mm -hmm. and I was wondering about that. If that's just because of human physiognomy that you at first, if you, based on the lighting, if you aren't looking for uh, something a racialized text, do we just miss it, or is it just that people took a general view and just decided in advance that well, mm -hmm. yeah, there won't be any black people in that? And there was one person in particular who was obviously of mixed ancestry. And um, some other people were just not seeing him. And I, you know, saw him right away that was there. So I was wondering what that tells us about, um, about our society, about our predispositions. When we look at groups of people um, either to have someone stand out or to overlook someone because of our, our, our physical features. And what, how does this work? by you tie into this issue of memory that so much of your work deals with because if you deal with the archives you're dealing with memory mm -hmm. so um what is the role of memory in your work do you feel you can put all of your psychology uh <laughs> credentials in there she <laughs> pull on that you know i i i think it I think it comes back to the, the stories that we tell about ourselves um, and that we tell about our experiences um, are so critical to our ability to navigate difficult situations. Um, and I think this sort of creative process, this sort of archival work uh, could readily be depressing, right? could readily be something that uh, feels discouraging, but when paired with this counter narrative work when paired with uh, just, you know, the, the beauty of the black form and all of these different uh, images, uh, it's, it's crafting a different idea. It's crafting a different experience. And you're also able to see those through lines a bit more. Uh, I, I think about, um, you know, my, my grandparents on both sides of my family, both grew up in that red line neighborhood. They didn't know each other at all, right? Mm -hmm. They moved to different communities one of them moves to uh, a neighborhood that my parents then falsified my address to get them oh. in, to get me and my brothers into that school, right? So um, developing a counter to get us into a better space, right? So, um, and then us taking that journey, the number five bus uh, to our grandparents' house and then pretending that our granddad was our dad so that we could hop on the yellow bus and then going to school and then coming back and doing that for six years. And then, you know, from there, getting into a school for the gifted that was only available at this one school. And then, you know, it's just, it's just these narratives start to tie together. And uh, there are so many acts of resistance of, of self-efficacy of collective efficacy that happen along the way um, that again, if not, if not sat with, if not explored, if not, um, working to understand the, the true depth of that act of resistance um, in all of those different contexts, it, it, it can easily uh, just be seen as a negative, it can just be seen as like this, this horrific thing, but it isn't, right? Um, so I think, that's, I think that's the role of memory. I don't know if that answers your question. It is, well, it, it is. well your, your answer actually raises another question. So what you're, you're saying, um, this is kind of finding beauty in some of the things that were ugly, uh, finding a, a way to create peace that allows one to move forward. And, and that goes back to my um, other question. Um, you know, what are the strategies we should be employing in order to create community, to create society where there can be equity, where there can be greater equality, where we can have these discussions and the discussions are about things from the past that don't have to be continued. We can stop doing the, the bad things, um, but so many people are uncomfortable with the past, they just don't want to talk about it. So 
how can we have these discussions about these very um, complicated and sometimes truly awful issues? Um, and we can become emotional without necessarily just dwelling on the horrible thing that happened in the past. Yeah. How can we devise a language um, where we can go forward? It's can art help us do that? I honestly, I think it. I think it has to. Um, I. I think. I mean, I, I think about like truth and reconciliation in whatever context this doesn't happen without one side being willing to acknowledge the, the harm that they've caused. Um, and I think the pathway to get to acknowledging that harm or to sitting with it um, probably isn't going to take the form that was used to create it. Uh, and I think alternative processes like art um, like uh, engaging in direct dialogue, um, like gathering around food and the, the celebration yeah. of, I mean, you know, barbecue, you know, like, which is, you know, barbecue and soul food. Those are like, those are things that we can gather around and they also have kind of a rough legacy that, that informs them, right? Comfort, so, yes, um, comfort, absolutely. Yeah, so, so, you know, you think about, creating those opportunities, those spaces where that sort of thing can happen. And I think art is, is a critical piece of that, absolutely. So um, I've been hogging the conversation. So I think uh, it's, it's like 6.12, we usually go until 6.30. I think there are probably members of the audience who will have some questions they'd like to ask you. So I'd like to open up the conversation now to our audience. Um, if you don't feel comfortable, uh, you know, coming on camera because we're being recorded, you can put your question in the chat and I can read it, but I would prefer if possible to hear your own voice and to have you, if you have a question for Malcolm, to please come on camera and ask your question. So is there anyone who'd like to, to break the ice for the audience? Because I'll have 10,000 questions. <laughs> I, I find this work fascinating, it's, it's incredible. Anyone? Well, I have a question. Excellent, Ian. Ian is the way with Ian is the person responsible for this conversation, because Ian is our curator at the Fab Gallery at South Carolina State University, and he's the person who brought Malcolm's images to South Carolina. So please, do offer your question, Ian. Uh, thanks, guys, and Malcolm. Thank you again for taking the time to do this. Like we we really appreciate having you, and I'm glad that I'm glad that there was resonance between the distances between our respective places. And it's, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to see that. Um, when you talked about this exhibition being a poster show specifically, and I just wanted to kind of ask you, how do you view that format as being an act of resistance? How do you view the idea of a poster as something that is disposable, ephemeral, put up immediately and then taken down? Like, how do you feel that factors into the work? Yeah, it's a, that's a really great question. Uh, so when I first began conceptualizing these pieces, uh, my goal was to wheat paste, um, which is, you know, taking uh, 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 large scale prints and mixing a flour and water sort of paste and, and pasting them up in different areas. So my goal with them originally was to place them in some of the disinvested environments um, in order to kind of force that dialogue around, uh, you know, what does a swamp look like in different contexts? What do counters, what do consecrations look like in different contexts? So uh, I, have, I have thought of these images as, um, as disposable, as, posters as items that can be remixed and deployed in a number of ways. Um, I, I had a show, I think last summer at this point, uh, uh, outside of Detroit on an island called Harsons Island. Uh, and it was a, a former Boy Scout camp uh, where all of the buildings were abandoned um, and boarded up. So I developed uh, collages using some of those posters uh, and using some screen printing and, uh, and actually some kind of tempura, like kind of gold foiling uh, in order to create 
collages that served as counters in a disinvested space. Um, so I, I've enjoyed working in that medium. I would love to screen print these things um, and have them more permanent, but I also really like the idea of removing the idea of it having to be within a gallery in order for it to be a place where the dialogue happens. Uh, so um, definitely, I guess that's the, that's kind of the, the goal. And we'll still plan on uh, maybe trying to wheat paste some stuff around the region. Great. Great. Yeah, I don't know if Ian realizes how brilliant his question was because of course the poster is how you advertise for runaway slaves. The poster is how you uh, put these notices up um, about people for sale and to have a, a people's art because you could take a poster directly to the public. You don't have the mediating building of a museum or anything between the, the audience. And so it, it is revolutionary. Um, I do it, put them, do them as broadsides, put them all around. I, I think that's a fantastic idea. I love that. Anybody else with a thank you, Ian. <laughs> I should have known you'd come up with this great question. Anyone else with a question for Malcolm in our audience? I wish I had more students here. Well, how they're thinking, or is, is there a question? So with the insurance piece that was from Charleston, I was, I was thinking about that. How did you come, so in your own research, because why, what motivated you to look through these archives if you're a health, you're literally a kind of healthcare worker, a public health uh, worker, what motivated you to go into the archives to look for these materials? Was it in any way related to your own concept of public health? Wow, that's a, that's a really great question. Uh, I have a few answers for you. Um, one, it is absolutely related to public health. Uh, there's this concept of social determinants of health, right? Where you live, where you work, where you play, what you have access to determines your health and well being. Uh, your health happens far before you ever make it to the doctor. So, uh, how can we discuss those social factors without discussing the things that shape those social factors, right? Um, redlining, uh, that practice that we talked about earlier, has been uh, pretty strongly connected and correlated with COVID-19 rates, uh, with uh, triple negative breast cancer, which affects Black women predominantly, with uh, uh, heart disease, with, uh, with uh, you know, environmental health in a number of ways. So the social structures um, actually are another example of the thing that can feel banal or, or boring, but actually is a type of violence, is a type of structural violence. So. Uh, when, when it comes to public health and these sorts of things, I think it's critical to kind of connect those dots and to see that through line um, and to work to intentionally undo that which was done before. Um, so that's one answer. Uh, on the archive side, it's, it's been a hobby. It's been a joy of mine just for quite some time. Uh, I, uh, I was, was inspired and, and started sitting with some imagery from uh, uh, Toledo Police Yearbook that was released in 1900 um, and developed my, actually my first counter narrative poem around uh, a piece from there. Um, and it just, it felt right, you know, it felt, it felt right. Uh, and that's really where it moved from sitting with and enjoying consuming these things to uh, creating something else out of them. Uh, so the, the search has been there just, I wouldn't say for as long as I can remember, but for quite some time. Uh, and it's the sort of thing that started, you know, with, you know, uh, uh, the photography of my grandparents, right? And then eventually transitioned into other types of archival work, so, yeah. So do you think archives, uh, I guess this may be a silly question, but do you think archives can be healing? I mean, archives can reveal trauma in the past, but they also reveal facts about experience that translate to, well, how did I arrive at, you know, how do we arrive collectively where we are? How do I arrive at where I am? Do you think that um, 
it's in any sense essential that we have this grounding contextual information for our own, again, for our own health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or is it better to forget it? Is it better to just, yeah. I, I, I personally think that it's critical. I've, I've engaged in just this kind of ancestral work in a number of ways, you know, I, uh, uh, I ran a, a small urban farm a number of years ago. Uh, most of the youth were black and brown uh, or just people that, you know, uh, were suffering in some way in the world that they were in. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things that we did is we identified the, the plants, the, the food items that came from their different cultures and we gave them the opportunity to grow them. So one of the things that I grew um, is called a fish pepper. Um, it's yeah, a, fish. A, a fish pepper. It's a, it's a hot pepper. Uh, it's pepper. Got, yeah, that's got variegated leaves. So they're green and white. It's beautiful. And uh, the, the pepper has kind of a, a, a soft, like kind of white underbelly and a green top. Um, and it transitions to like kind of a greenish orange. And it's a delightful pepper. I grew it from seed. Uh, and it's also, you know, one of the seeds that um, Black folks brought over in a little ball of mud when they were uh, pulled away from the continent, you know, and, I, and I, I found that experience so meaningful, you know, it was tying food, uh, connections with one another, uh, the, the beauty of the present state, despite the, the struggle and the structures that um, inform the need to even carry it with them. The fact that that seed persisted for hundreds of years in order to make it to the point where I could grow it myself, you know? So um, I think that that engagement with these things can take a lot of different forms and there's potential healing in all of them. Um, if we're willing to, to explore them and sit with them and understand that existence at this point is an act of resistance, you know? Mm. Uh, the fact that we exist right now, despite all those things, you know? Um, I actually, one of the other things as I've been diving more deeply into the personal work um, is I found uh, the owner of my, my uh, maternal grandfather's line. Uh, mm. So I found a portrait of the man that owned my, I think, fourth great grandfather um, and a document that's just a slave schedule that says um, uh, men between the ages of six and 18. And it just has, you know, this is probably your great, great, great grandfather. It's not even a name, it's just a number, right? One of the numbers. Um, and I found a portrait of the home that Abraham Green lived in uh, and the entire story around that. And so I think about uh, you know, like that, that, that home was torn down in 1962, something like that, in order to build a dam. So mm -hmm. literally, right, so literally, uh, the, the land that we worked and that we likely died on uh, is underwater, right, mm -hmm. in some place in Greenbelt, Alabama, probably, right. Mm -hmm. So I have that memory. I have these these spiritual practices that I'm beginning to explore and I need to go there. I need to go to that land. I need to go to that water and I need to do something. Um, and I, I believe that that will be an opportunity for healing. Um, and I'm not, you know, necessarily sitting with the pain of this owner. You know, I'm thinking, I'm like, I'm not thinking about the owner. I'm thinking about uh, doing right by by my ancestors, by mm -hmm. those folks. So, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm just wondering if uh, your ancestors would be buried on that land that's underwater and they wouldn't have moved those graves. So they are, they are that alluvial mud. They are that, they, they are the land there now and yeah. that life-giving water. So um, in one way, it's quite beautiful. In another way, of course, it's, it's uh, quite sad. So I guess it's our option. What, and this is part of what your work is, is showing that it's our option how we think about and come to terms with the knowledge about this very difficult past. Yep. Um, let me just see if anybody has put a question in the chat. Is there, are there any questions from our audience? 
I can't believe that no one has questions for you. <laughs> no or maybe they they all understand everything. Maybe they just uh, they get they get what you're doing much uh, more easily than I do. Um, well, the last question I will ask this Dennis. All right, what really inspired you to become a visual artist? Because as you as you pointed out with your biography, you were in psychology. You're working in public health. You're um, you have a, a health center that you're managing. What led you to visual arts in particular? Why didn't you sing? Why didn't you write rap music? Why didn't you, are there any other, there's a number of things perhaps you probably could have done. Why the visual medium in particular? Uh, I think the aesthetic of informal compositions that are found in, in photography um, uh, has always just sat well with me. Uh, my father had film photos up around the house from, uh, from classes that he took when he was younger. Uh, I loved, I loved looking through my, my grandparents, uh, old photos. Um, and I also just loved movies and like cinematography. Um, so I've, I've always been drawn to informal composition that has a, a real uh, beauty and kind of aesthetic quality to it. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I think that's really where it came from. Um, and I'm good with my hands, I guess, you know, so I think that's also a piece of it as well. So um, yeah. So Ian's had to withdraw. We know that Ian had a personal uh, health emergency in his family. And we, I'd like to thank Ian for bringing us together and for helping to make this conversation possible. I also would like to say that the thing that is standing, that's going to, uh, I'm going to take away with me is when you said, um, how, I forget how you said it, but what I took from it was persistence. Persistence is resistance, that enduring is itself an act of resistance. That's not exactly what you said. But I, that's what I pulled from it. And certainly by looking at archives and showing the documentation of persistence is in a way to bring the truth to the fore, that is an act of resistance. And resistance in that sense is a very positive and affirming thing. Sometimes I think of resistance as you're holding something off, you're, you're negating something. But um, resistance that you've created is an affirmation. And I'd like to uh, thank you for this incredible work um Thank you. you're part of a series that we've been doing on uh, this uh on being a citizen i'm going to go back and share and i think this is where yeah so i'm just going to go through and show you what some of the other things you've talked about um we, this is an African-American memorial in South Carolina by Ed Dwight, and he was one of the artists we talked to. And he, like you, had come to art from a different, an entirely different field. He started out as an aeronautical engineer, and he became a sculptor. And this is uh, the monument to the African-Americans in South Carolina, which is interesting for so many reasons, because it's an historical monument with no names and no specifics of who is participating, but it shows you know, the chattel slavery, uh, the ships, and it shows events from uh, the beginning of the slave system to resistance during the uh, Civil War and then Reconstruction, and finally moving into the more modern age. And it shows people who are important, but he was not allowed on this memorial to put the names of individuals such as Althea Gibson, who was the tennis star from here, or Dizzy Gillespie, who's the jazz star, or Justice Ernest Finney, who's the first African-American chief justice of our state, or Ron McNair, who became an astronaut. He shows the people, but you'd have to know the history to understand it. And so it's odd because it's an historical monument that is uh, about erasure. And to a certain extent, I saw a similar kind of theme in your work. And then on our campus just recently, Dr. Pilalupe Falani, who is the chairman of our art department, created these sculptures of the three young men who were uh, killed in the Orangeburg massacre on our campus. 
Um, now, in Kent State happened in 1970. This was in 1968, so it was before. And the sacrifice in our campus is something that most people are not aware of. And Dr. Flani created these bronze sculptures. And as it happens, Dr. Flani is Nigerian. And so these bronze sculptures on our campus by an artist who trains young people today is a direct lineage from the great uh, bronze casting of the Yoruba peoples of Ile Ife. So I don't know if our students appreciate this connection um, in this commemoration of the young men who uh, sacrificed themselves in our campus for civil rights, but it directly links us to that ancestral African uh, ideal. And so today you've shown another sort of tie into that. And I'd like to thank you for the thoughtful, extraordinary quality of your work. And I thought that Dr. Alison McCletchie would also be here today. She's usually here for our programs. Um, but this has been a production through the IP Stanek Museum in, com in combination with the uh, Visual and Performing Arts Program at South Carolina State University. And also our co-sponsors, the South Carolina Progressive Network, which is an organization about human rights and the Majeska Simpson School, which is dealing with the issues that we've talked about. And we've just begun this Twigs Rose Festival of the Arts to try to use the arts as a healing tool to bring our communities together. So I'm so happy that you are our inaugural event. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you, thank Malcolm you Cunningham. Me. Thank you for having me. Yes. All right. And that concludes the official part of our program. We can now end our recording.